preacher that um, at the end of service, he went to the back of the sanctuary, as, as I normally do, and greeted people and things like that. And, and there was a little boy that came out and, and uh, handed the preacher a dollar bill at the end of service. And, and the uh, preacher said, well, that's kind of you. And he thought, well, what a blessing. This little boy thinks so much of me that he's given me a dollar bill. And so he, he talked to the little boy. He said, well, that's such a nice thing for you to do. What possessed you to give me that dollar bill, thinking it was going to be this grand thing? He said, well, preacher, he said, I was at, at breakfast this morning, and my daddy made the comment that you was the poorest preacher he'd ever heard. And I thought I would give you... That took a while to sink in. And I thought I'd just give you a dollar bill. Well, I, I'm telling you that because of this. Last Sunday morning after I told that, I went out into the lobby out front, and two of my precious little grandsons came running up to me, and they both handed me dollar bills. And I'm still trying to find out, figure out, if it was God's way of keeping me humble, or if it was some of you wise people's way of making a point. <laughs> I haven't figured that out, but uh, Merle plead the fifth. He said, I didn't have anything to do with that. Anyway, it's a great day to be in God's house, and this morning we're going to be looking at uh, the second sermon in the series, I Am a Christian. Now today, if you're a Christian, I want to hear you say, yeehaw. Yeehaw. All right, we got that down last week. I love that. So, so the believers in Christ, I am a Christian. Last week we talked about the church and its identity. The church has an identity. We are forming an identity as First Baptist Church. One of the things that I love about the church right now is we're at a point in history when we can re-identify who we really are, who, what we're about. Because moving into a new building, into a new era, into a new time gives us that opportunity. A lot of churches don't have... Uh, the, the pleasure of having. So remember last week we talked about a church being identified by its movement, by its message, by its ministries, and by its members. That's, that's you. It's members. So today I don't want to talk about the church's identity. I want to move into something different. We're going to talk today of all things about believers' baptism. You know, today we have seven candidates that are going to be baptized. And so I, I know as the church grows and new people come in and, and from different walks of life, and some of you, we are so glad you're coming to church here. And we're so glad that you're joining in to be a part of this family. And as you come in, you need to know what we're about. You need to know what we believe. And, and, and so you can learn that in Sunday school. It's a great place to learn. You can learn that in Bible study. But also from the, from the pulpit, I believe that, that I need to make it clear what we believe. And believer's baptism can sometimes be confusing. Believer's baptism can sometimes have questions behind it. Believer's baptisms, now, now I know what I believe. I know what this church believes, but maybe some of you don't. So I want you to hear what we believe about believer's baptism. Did you know that baptism is a big part of a Christian's identity? The baptism of a believer. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to expound upon what we truly believe believers' baptism is all about. So what I want you to do is I want you to stand as we read God's Word in honor of God's Word. And we're going to read this passage, and then I'm going to open it up, and we're going to, we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 25. It says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them and he, at, at the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. 
And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Let us pray. Father, we come to you as at the reading of your word. Lord, I believe that your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word reveals who you are. It reveals your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today that we would stand upon your word. I pray that we would stand upon the words, Lord, that you had inspired great men of faith to write. God, I pray that we would just look at your word today. And as we stand here in your presence today, we pray for your presence, God, that you would move in our hearts and minds. God, I pray for the one here today that may not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that, God, they would surrender their life to you today. I pray for those being baptized today, Lord. Believer's baptism, Lord, I pray that we would see exactly what believer's baptism is all about. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Please be seated. So this morning, here's what I want to do for these next few minutes. I'm going to give you four key elements of true believer's baptism. Four key elements that I believe is a part of true believer's baptism. Now, first of all, I want you to hear this. There is a story behind the baptism. There's a story behind the baptism. There's always a story behind the baptism. When you get to the point that someone's entering this water, there's some kind of a story behind that. Now, I believe that everybody has a story. Your story may not be at that point yet. Your story may be that all of a sudden, I'm at First Baptist Church, and God is moving, God is speaking to me. I don't know exactly what's happening in my life. Your story may be that I've been a Christian longer than I've been, been uh, uh, anything else in my life. I've been a Christian for 70 years, but everybody has a story. Well, I can tell you today, this passage that I just read, this passage from God's Word is about a transformed life. It's about a transformed life, a changed life. And the good news of this today is that God is in the business of transforming lives. Did you know that? God wants to change your life. God wants to transform your life. I don't care where you stand in your walk. God wants to make you closer to Him and better and give you a better life. I believe that this passage is about a transformed life. It is about the transformed life of a jailkeeper. Now, in modern day terms, I guess instead of calling him a jailkeeper, we would say he was a prison guard. He was one who guarded prisons. He was a Roman soldier in charge of guarding prisons prisoners. So this man was a guy that, here, here's what it is, and sometimes we read the scripture and we forget these are real life people who are living their life and then something happens in their life. You see, this man was guarding Paul and Silas in prison. He was a jailkeeper. Here's what he was doing. He was just doing his job. How many of you today would say, you know what, I just want to do my job. I just want to go to work. I'm going to do my job. I just want to put my time in. That's what he was doing. He was doing his job, and he was doing a good job of it, apparently. All of a sudden, this man who was just doing his job, going through life, all of a sudden, he faced a crisis in his life. Now, this crisis was something that was out of his control. But I can tell you this, if you're facing something in your life that seems out of control, it's never out of God's control. This crisis in his life was this. He was facing the crisis to the point that he actually, coming from Scripture, he actually was at the point of suicide. He had pulled his sword out, and he's ready to kill himself. Folks, today, there are people that are going through life that are facing things that come over them so strongly that they think somehow about suicide. Folks, I can tell you this, that is never the way out. And here today, I feel that God gave me that word to speak because I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're at. Now, I know something about you, but I don't know everything about you. But God knows. And some people, even believers, somehow can think that in their mind. I can tell you this today. No matter what the crisis, God wants to change your life. No matter where you are in life, God has something he's trying to show you, trying to tell you, trying to reveal to you. He's trying to show you his love his grace, and his mercy. This Philippian jailkeeper was at the point of killing himself, and all of a sudden, he experienced life change. He was at the lowest of low, and all of a sudden, God was going to show him that he was going to take him to the highest of highs. Now, there's a story behind that. Now, I'm telling you the truth. There's always a story behind a baptism. 
This man's story included Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were a part of this man's story. Now, I want to look at the scripture here for a minute and look at this. In verse 25, it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul and Silas, they were in jail. Why were they in jail? Because they didn't break the law. They didn't steal something. They hadn't murdered anyone. They hadn't done anything basically wrong in God's eyes. But they were in jail. They were in jail for preaching the gospel. They were in jail because of their faith. They were in jail because they were trying to help people's lives be changed. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm thrown in jail, the last thing I'm probably going to think about doing is what Paul and Silas did. You know what they did? They didn't say, woe is me. They didn't say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? God, why have you left me and forsaken me? God was right there with them. And at that time, when they hadn't been beaten half to death, and when they had been put in chains and the shackles around their feet, and I was reading into that, and actually it wasn't just chains around their legs. They would put chains around their legs and spread their legs apart to inflict pain upon them. And they were enduring all kinds of pain, and they did exactly what you and I would do, right? We'd start singing to Jesus, right? They began to praise God. They began to pray, and they began to sing to Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Listen to me, Christians. You say, I am a Christian, your Christian faith will never be stronger than when you're going through a difficulty and people hear exactly what you have to say. How you react to that, what you do in your life, people are watching. Did you know that? There are people watching every move that you make. They're listening to everything you have to say. In verse 25, it says the prisoners were listening to them. How much of a witness was it that he, they were listening to to Paul and Silas, sing hymns, they're, they're, they've been beaten, they're in this jail, and all of a sudden they hear at midnight they're singing songs to God. These people were listening, apparently the soldiers were listening too. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. Do you know that God's in control of all nature? Do you know that anything that happens in nature is still under God's control? Jesus can calm the storms, he can part the Red Sea, he can do whatever he wants through creation, and he can even cause an earthquake. Now, this wasn't a normal earthquake. This was a supernatural earthquake that caused the chains to be broken on every prisoner's legs. All of a sudden, the physical bondage that they were in became a physical freedom that they had to enjoy. Now, I want you to listen to me because this is the point that kind of tricks in here. Just because God has physically set you free does not mean spiritually that you can do whatever you want. God has cleansed you in your flesh, your sinfulness, your life. He has cleansed you from all your unrighteousness. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, but that does not give you spiritual freedom to go and do. Now, I don't know about you, but let's see. Uh, if I was in jail and I had been beaten and I knew that I may die in jail and I knew that I was going to be beaten again and, and all these things are going on and an earthquake happened and I knew God must have done something, what would I have done? I'd have been out that back door real quick. But Paul and Silas had the presence of mind to say, you know what, God, what do you want us to do with this? What are you doing here? And they stayed right where they were. And they had such an impact on these other prisoners who were not believers at the time that they stayed right there with them. I don't know about you, but if, if, if they, these guys have a God that can free them and they stay because there's something to do, I'm sticking close to them. And that's exactly what these prisoners did. You know, there's a story behind this, folks. The jailkeeper, he woke up. I'm sure the earthquake shook him out of bed. I don't know if you've ever been through an earthquake before, but it can shake you and wake you up and confuse you and scare you and all that. I believe this tremor, this earthquake, woke him up. He sat up out of bed, and he realized, I've got to go check on my prisoners. So he goes to the prison beside his home. He goes over, and all of a sudden he sees the doors open, and he says this, oh my gosh, they have escaped, and I'm going to die. I would rather die myself at my hand than die in the hands of those who are going to kill me because a, for a prison guard to lose a prisoner, they face the same consequence, they would be killed. This man was within inches of killing himself, of losing his life, of dying, and all of a sudden the story came to life. Paul called with a loud voice saying, do no harm to yourself because we're all here. Do you know, folks, that God right now 
If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't care what circumstance you're going through, I don't care where God has you placed in life, God has a reason for you to say, listen up, folks, God is here. Listen up, folks, we're still here. I'm here with you. And the question that comes, and I'll, I'll leave this point, are you living a life in such a way to become part of somebody's story? As a believer in Jesus Christ, if I am a Christian, are you living your life in such a way that someone could say, I'm so glad that they were faithful to Jesus. I'm so glad that under all these circumstances, I was so close to ending my life, to thinking life was over for myself, that all of a sudden, you become a part of their story. You see, that's what God wants from his believers. Sometimes it causes pain. Sometimes it causes us to hold back when, God may, when you may think, God's setting me free. God says, no, you stay right here. Because I have something for you to do. The first element is the story behind the baptism. The next part of it, the next element, is the reason for the baptism. The reason for the baptism. Now, we know that they stayed behind. There's a story behind this baptism. What about the reason? Do you know, it doesn't matter if you're baptized, or when you're baptized, there is a reason for that. The truth is, there's many people who proclaim to be a Christian who went through baptism, who may not really be a Christian. Now folks, let me back that up here for a minute, because I believe it's a life-changing question. You see, this man, whenever he asked the, the Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He saw the truth of Paul and Silas. He saw the reality. Paul and Silas, they are really authentic Christians, and whatever they've got, I want that. I want the same God. I want the same Savior in Jesus. Whatever it is, that's what I want. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, salvation is this. God is saving you from something, and God is saving you to something. God is saving you from yourself. God is saving you from your sin, from your lifestyle that is against what God wants for you. In other words, let me back this up here. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in other words, there is no one righteous, no, not one. So everyone is living away from God. God is saving us from ourselves, from our sins, but he's also saving us to something. Now, I want to be saved from my sinfulness. I want to be saved from hell. I want to be saved from the destiny that I'm on, but I also know that I'm saved to something. Do you know that God is saving you not only from something, he's saving you to a better life. He's saving you to eternity with him. He's saving you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's saving you to an abundant life. You know, a lot of people say that they're Christians. A lot of people have been baptized. But are they really Christians? You know, I heard a story one time I wanted to share with you about a teacher who was an atheist. He was an atheist teacher, and, and, and believe me, there's atheist teachers in our school systems. So there's, a, there's an atheist teacher, and atheist teachers, they want to influence our kids to believe that there is no God. And so this teacher thought she would take the authority that she had in the school and she would take and she would try to convince the kids to believe like she believed. So she asked the little kids, and it was a little kindergarten, third grade, third grade class. A third grade class, and so she said, students, I want to ask you a question. She said, I'm an atheist, and, 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 and I believe that there is no God, and, and, and that's what an atheist believes. So I want to see by raising my hand, how many of you believe, how many, how many of you are an atheist? And all the little kids raise their hand. Because little kids will do that. All the little kids but one in the back of the class, and this little boy did not raise his hand. And she looked at him, and she thought, why in the world didn't he raise his hand? I said, I'm an atheist, and they said, and I, I thought that every kid would raise her hand. He did not raise his hand. So she called on little Johnny. She said, Johnny, are you not an atheist? He said, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. And she said, oh, really? Well, what makes you a Christian? He said, well, my mommy's a Christian. My daddy's a Christian, and my grandmas and grandpas are Christian, so I'm a Christian. And she looked at him, and she thought, well, that little thinker. I'm not going to stand for this. So she, she thought to herself, well, let me ask you a question. She said, you're a Christian because your mommy's a Christian, your daddy's a Christian, and your grandma and grandpa's a Christian. Yes, I am. She said, well, let me ask you this. 
if your mommy was a moron, and your daddy was a moron, and your grandma and grandpa were a moron, what would that make you? He said, that's easy. I'd be an atheist. <laughs> yes. You know, the truth of the matter is, just because we say we're a Christian doesn't mean we're a Christian. Just because you claim to be a Christian, you can come to church, you can say all the right things, you can do all the right things, but what is the reason behind it? What is the reason why you're getting into that tank? Folks, it is so important that you realize exactly what this Philippian jailer was told. What must I do to be saved? And here's what they said in verse 31. They said, you need to get baptized. No, they didn't. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It didn't say be baptized. It said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How much plainer can it get than that? It's Jesus that saves you. If you need Christ in your life, if you're looking for the answer, if you want to get to God, you cannot get there on your own. It's Jesus. You can say you're a Christian. You can come to church. You can give all the right answers. You can do, try to do the good things and not the bad things. You can even be baptized in a tank of water. But unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Amen. And if you're not saved, you're not a Christian. Amen. You see, the reason for baptism has to be the right reason. There's a right reason and there's a wrong reason to be baptized. I believe the right reason is exactly in thir verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved, and you and all your household. Now, I'm just going to take a brief second there. I don't have time to expound on that. You and your household. So some people say, well, then, if I'm saved, then does that mean my household is good too? That is not what Scripture says. Do you know what happens when you take one or two Scriptures out of context and use that to base what God said? It messes you up. It puts you to the point in your life where you're believing something that's not true. What well, says it in the Bible? Well, the Bible says that you take the whole counsel of God. And when we take the whole counsel of God, and whenever we look at that and we look at it, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, you and your household. Now look what it says after that. Look what it says in the, in the scriptures, the following. In verse 32, listen to me if you don't have a Bible, listen to what they say. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to the Philippian jailer. They spoke to him individually, listen, and to all who were in his household. Did you catch that? They spoke to the Philippian jailer individually, and then they spoke to his household individually that you must accept the Jesus, Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior for you to be saved. Here's what I believe happens. We can look out in First Baptist Church, and there are whole families that are in First Baptist Church, and I praise God for that. Amen? How many times do we see whole families coming into the house of God because one person gets saved, and then the next one in her house, and the next one in her house, and the next one in her house? It is an individual choice. We've seen that. You may be a part of one of those families that maybe a, a child got saved, and the next thing you know, the whole family's here. You see, when God begins to move in a household... God can save a whole household. Whenever God begins to move in one man, and listen to this, you may say, but there's nobody else in my household saved. You live like a Christian. You be saved. You be Jesus to them, and they may be saved too. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Salvation is an individual decision. Here's the, here's the bottom line. Salvation is not like a bunch of girls going to the restroom. I don't understand the philosophy behind that. I'll never understand it. If a girl is 10 or a girl is 40, one girl goes, 10 of them go. <laughs> guys, I've never heard a guy say, hey, guys, let's go to the bathroom. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. It's just, that would be weird, you know it? Okay, I'm going to the bathroom. Oh, we're all going too. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't have to go that bad. I'm okay. But girls, for some reason, I don't know what you do in the bathroom, and I don't know what goes on, but just keep it there, okay? <laughs> Salvation is not groups, it's individuals. You know, when we have VBS, we take very strong, painstaking these steps so that when we present the gospel to your children and to the children who come, that they don't make a group decision for Jesus. That's not the way it works. 
Do you know, I could be like that atheist teacher and I could say at Bible school, I could easily, easily say, I could have 50 kids sitting in here and we always have a time when we share Christ with them after they're getting the Word of God in their hearts and in their minds. And I could easily say, okay, all you kids who want to be a Christian, you meet me right here. Come on, let's do it. Let's go right now. And every kid would be right here. Easily. So we make very sure that every child understands it's an individual decision. It's a personal decision. It's a one-on-one -on -one decision. So we make it harder for kids to accept Christ in that way. And folks, I can tell you that's a good thing. Because the last thing I, I want is for somebody to be 50 years old and say, you know what, I, I, did, I, I went forward because all my friends went forward to Bible school, but now I'm questioning, am I really saved? You know one of the hardest people, Doug Payne and I just had this conversation last night. Some people say the hardest decision you'll ever make in your life is to accept Christ. And I say that's wrong. The hardest decision for anyone to ever make in their life is someone who says they've accepted Christ and then has to admit that they actually didn't. Someone who's been in the baptismal tank and says, you know what, I, I really didn't understand what I was doing. I, I was too young. Now, now, I was eight years old when I was saved, and I know I was saved. So don't be fearful that if you're young that you're not saved because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's an individual choice, and if you made a group decision, if you, you, if you, if the hardest thing to do is admit, you know what, I, I've, I've lived a Christian life, but I'm not a Christian. The reason for baptism is because you've given your life to Christ. Next thing, that the element of that is the observance of baptism. That's what we're going to do here in just a little bit. The observance of baptism. After salvation comes baptism. After salvation, you're born again, a believer in Jesus Christ, comes baptism. The observance of baptism. You know, this man's life had changed. And the hardest thing for me to see is someone who says they give their life to Jesus, and you see no change in their life. Because God is in the changing business. This man, now look, this man was a Philippian jailer. He was keeping them in prison. He was probably taking great joy in inflicting pain upon them. And look what happened after he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 30, 33. And he took them the same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes. Oh my gosh. The same man that was involved with beating them now took them in and bandaged them. It goes on and says, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Look at verse 34. When he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed with God, in God, with all his household. He not only takes them in and bandages them, he brings them into his house and gives them the best food that he's got. Do you see the change? Do you understand the difference? All of a sudden, this man went from doing his job, just trying to do the right thing, being a good person. I'm a good soldier. I'm earning a living for my family. Everything's good. He, he had that crisis in his life. He came to the point that all of a sudden, God changed him. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He went from beating to bandaging the prisoners. You know what happened? This man's life has changed on the inside. Now, I don't know about you, but when I experience something in my life on the inside, the most frustrating thing in the world that can happen is when you can't express it on the outside. I'd love to tell you on the inside what it's like to go to Costa Rica. If you haven't been there, all I can do is let you see the excitement in my eyes and my face and my expressions, but you just can't quite understand it. I'd love for you to know what it's like to go on a Carpenters for Christ trip, but you, if, I can only let you know what happened on the inside. In fact, this is a perfect time to plug this. In the fall of this year, in September, listen to me. If you've got a pen, write it down. In September this year, we're going to offer another mission trip for you guys, another brand new type of mission trip. In September over Labor Day weekend, we're going to team up with Doug and Sandy and a church in Jackson, Mississippi. And we're going to go down into the inner city of Jackson, Mississippi to a church, Southside Baptist Church, and we're going to go down there and we're going to do a mission project down there, probably some kind of a street fair or something, and we're going to reach out to these inner city people, these kids and these people in this inner city. I'm not a carpenter. I don't go overseas. Can you go to Jackson, Mississippi? Can you go down there, spend a few hours driving down there, have a weekend of, of serving God, of showing who Jesus really is to these people who need Christ in their life? 
If you want to do that, mark your calendars, Labor Day weekend. We're going to take a group of people down there, and you're going to come back and say, I can't believe I experienced that so greatly on the inside. I'm so glad that God gave me that opportunity. I was hesitant, but I went anyway. You know, baptism is this. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward change that happens in someone's life. I can tell you what Jesus has done in my life. I can tell you that Jesus saved me. But folks, I can't, I can't show you. I can do acts of obedience to God in order to, tell, to show you that. But I can't express it. Baptism is an expression of obedience to God on the outside of what happened to you on the inside. That's exactly what baptism is. An outward sign of an inward change in your life. Baptism is this. It is a symbolic act of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, that's why I believe in immersion. I believe that in the Bible, when you look in the Greek text and you see that word baptized, it doesn't say to be sprinkled, it says to be immersed. And the reason why we're immersed is this. Now, I'm not going to try to take on a theological debate today about baptism being sprinkled or immersed, but here's, here's what I want to tell you to that. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you look at his word, when Jesus was baptized, he was immersed in the water. And after he was immersed in the water, he came up out of the water, and the heavens opened up, and God Almighty said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit in the form of an, a dove fell down upon him. Folks, that's the Trinity present at that baptism. Do you know that Jesus was died on the cross, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose three days later, amen? Because of that, baptism is symbolic. I've died to my old self, and I am a new creation. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things, old things are gone. Behold, all things become new. So I believe that baptism is this. When I am being taken under that water and brought back up, it is nothing uh, supernatural about it. It's symbolic of my death to my old self and my life in Christ. And that's what we observe. You know one of the most dangerous things for a Baptist preacher? I don't have a watch or a clock or a, anything on me right now. Todd, what time is it? 11.25. Okay, we're good. We're good to go. Okay, all right. I thought, you know, I may have preached for an hour and a half and I didn't realize at this point. 12.25? 10.25, 10, okay. I want you to know this. Finally, baptism is a celebration. Baptism is a celebration of new life. Baptism is a celebration of someone dying to their old self, coming to life in Jesus Christ. Not physically, but spiritually living because of Jesus. Do you know that I believe that churches fail a lot of times when they baptize new believers? You know, yesterday, we traveled to Grigsville. Traveled to Grigsville for a t-ball game. My oldest grandson has entered into the realm of baseball. Travel up there to t-ball. Now, if anybody has not seen an entry-level t-ball game, I can tell you this. It is fun and chaotic. It's organized chaos, and sometimes not even organized, is it, Kate, uh, Megan? She tries to herd the cattle together, that's right. Those kids, one minute, are paying attention, and the next second, they're out there, right? Where's Lacey at, right, Lacey? And then Grigsville's got a train track, and the train goes by, and the kids are watching the train go by. And then over here, the deer are walking out in the field, and the kids are walking, watching the deer go by. They're attention spans, and I can tell you this, you guys may make fun of the kids, how long is your attention span? Are you still paying attention to what God's trying to say to you? That was a freebie. I didn't even plan on that one. <laughs> you see, we went to watch a t-ball game, and we clapped and we cheered. And actually, the rules are all different because everybody gets to hit the ball. Everybody gets to round the bases. Nobody gets out. All these things because they're developing the patterns of how a baseball player should act. Do you know what, to a grandparent, you know what a t-ball game is? It's the first step of their grandson going to the major leagues. 
because I know my grandson's going to have to play in the major leagues. He's just that good. It's the first step into getting to where they want to be. Do you know, yesterday I stood right here on this platform with two young people, Josh and Leah. We had a wedding yesterday, and you know what? That wedding was fun. We had a great time with that wedding, and, and, and Josh and Leah came together, and here's what happened. They said, I do. They recited their own personal vows, which I think is always amazing. They exchanged rings. They tried to pour sand together. It didn't work as well as they wanted. There was a song sang, and, and, and these different things happened. And in the end, I pronounced them husband and wife. Do you know what that represented? That represented the first step in a lifetime of living and serving each other together. And serving the Lord. Now, where am I going with this? Listen to this. T-ball is the entry into the realm of baseball. Standing on a stage and saying, I do, is entering into the realm of holy matrimony. When somebody is baptized, they're standing in the realm in the first step of obedience to God. The God, the rest of my life belongs to you. So if you're going to be baptized here in just a moment, we have seven candidates. Think about this. This is an act of obedience of you following Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back. So what do we do? We get to be a part of that, right? When somebody plays t-ball, we clap and cheer for them. When somebody gets married, we, we yell and scream and holler and all this good stuff. But when somebody's baptized, the thing that changes someone's life, the salvation of a soul, folks, we need to celebrate like nothing else. So I want to get you to get your lungs cleared out. I want you to get your hearts and minds ready to go. Because here in a moment, we're going to baptize seven new believers in Jesus Christ. Not so they can be saved, but because they've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Some of you have had a part in them being saved. Do you know this building had a part in a lot of them being saved? Many of you working hand in hand on this building or, or being faithful to God have had a part in them accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. What must I do to be saved? Well, you've got to go to church. You've got to be baptized. You've got to be a good person. No. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask that the candidates go ahead and be dismissed at this time to go back and get ready for this baptism. And congregation, I want you to bow your heads for just a moment while these, these guys and gal is, is taking off here to go get ready. Todd, I want you to come and would you just play something. And the musicians, go ahead and come forward because we're going to turn into an invitation time really quickly here.